Good morning, and welcome to Peakland United Methodist Church's virtual worship service. You may notice that we are not quite in the sanctuary this week. Instead, we decided to film portions of our worship here at the Riverwalk. As we join in today's worship, as we prepare to lift up a joyful praise, I invite you to take in the scenery. I invite you to take in the joy, the peace, the love, and the hope that is present. And I invite you to join us as Jesus processes into Jerusalem. Will you join us in the call to worship? Blessed is the coming kingdom, Hosanna in the highest. Lift up your voices and lay your palms at his feet, Hosanna in the highest. See, today the Savior comes riding on a donkey, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are good, Hosanna in the highest. parking lot service today, since it's Palm Sunday, we are going to distribute palm crosses. I found out Andrew knows how to do something I have always wanted to learn how to do. He knows how to take one of those palm strips and turn it into a cross. So I've asked Andrew to teach us how to do that today. So there are a couple of different ways to do this, John. Um, the ones we're handing out today are actually two different palms and they're folded together that way. I'm gonna teach you how to do it with just one palm because it's a better use of resources. So the first thing you wanna do is figure out exactly how tall you want your cross to be. For the length of this palm, we have to be very short. So our cross is gonna be about that tall. Mm -hmm. So I fold down from here. You want to be careful not to crease because if you've got a palm that hasn't been in water, it will crack here. 
So then once you've got that set, you're going to come back up and fold at an angle like this to make the third arm. And then like we did before, we'll crease like that. So we've got three sections of a cross. Mm -hmm. Pull back to there, and we now have a cross. This is the easy part. The hard part is how you're going to tie the cross off. So for this method, I'm going to turn the cross like this at a 45 degree angle, so you can see there. And I am going to wrap the rest of my cross around the back, so it's now coming out like this. Mm -hmm. I cross around here. This is going to be the spot where the palm comes down in a moment. So we wrap the bottom of the cross fully and then we pull it up around the back. So our back now has its own little cross across mm -hmm. the middle. We pull the cross around again, and you'll notice that we have this spot that I saved. It's a little mm -hmm. pocket that the rest of the palm can just slide right into. And now if you had a longer palm, you could actually pull it all the way down so that it would come along the bottom edge. And so on one side, you see it being supported. And on mm -hmm. the other side, you've got this nice cross across the cross. Indeed. Let's bow together in prayer. Holy God, you're able to turn an instrument of torture into a symbol of victory. Help us to be people of the cross this day. This I ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Each week, we like to let you know how the church has been in ministry. And this week, on Thursday afternoon, we were the site for a Red Cross blood drive. Uh, that's an important ministry that we have to support our city and our region. We also like to hold one of our homebound members in prayer. And our member this day is Mary Culbertson, who resides at Westminster, Canterbury. Let us bow together in prayer. God, as all creation calls out, you are good. Hear our prayers. We lift up our church, God, that its ministry be your ministry. Hear our prayers. We lift up your children, God, that your love continue to live through them. Hear our prayers. We offer ourselves that we may continue to move towards your will. Hear our prayers. And we lift up our hearts, minds, and spirits that today's worship would nourish us so that we may continue to embody your kingdom in all that we do. Hear our prayers. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Hear now how God is speaking. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you. And immediately, as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Can we talk about Mark's gospel for a minute? It details the story of Jesus as a mysterious, charismatic leader who was remarkably difficult to understand. Things happen quickly, and it reads like a roller coaster, ripping us from one moment 
to the next moment at top speeds. Of the 59 times the word immediately is used in the New Testament, 41 of them appear in Mark's remarkably short gospel. Mark tells us that demons knew who Jesus was and that he silenced them so no one else would know. We see examples of this in chapter 1, verse 34, chapter 3, verse 11, and chapter 5, verse 7. We learn that Jesus hid his miracles, often telling people not to tell anyone what had happened, as seen in chapter 1, verse 44, chapter 7, verse 36, chapter 8, verse 26 and 29, and chapter 9, verse 9. And most importantly, we learn that even after walking with Jesus for three years, the disciples still did not understand most of what he said. We can see examples of that in chapters 4, verses 10 through 25 and 33, chapter 6, 52, chapter 8, 14 and 31, chapter 9, 5 and 32, chapter 10, 10, 13, 28. You get the point. In addition, Jesus foretells his death three different times before Holy Week. But his disciples still cannot grasp what he is telling them. So when Jesus enters Jerusalem, it should not surprise us that people were confused. Jesus begins his journey into Jerusalem at the Mount of Olives, the location that tradition said the final battle for the liberation of Jerusalem would begin. He arrives just in time for the Passover, a feast in the Jewish tradition, and he is greeted with a confused mixed message. Some of the people are seen laying down palm branches, or as Mark says, leafy branches, the traditional welcome for pilgrims arriving for a feast. Some of them lay down their garments before Jesus in a way reminiscent of the arrival of Jehu for his ascension to the throne in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 9, verse 13. The people chant, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our ancestor David, lifting up a loud praise for Jesus as he rides into town. Yet he rides in not on a war horse ready to claim the city, but on a donkey, a common mount. And when he walks into the temple, he looks around, and then leaves, returning to Bethany where he started the day. This is a remarkably confusing story. Is Jesus royalty? If so, where were the Romans to arrest him? Is he a pilgrim preparing for the Passover? If so, why make such a big deal about riding a donkey that has never been ridden, making it acceptable for ceremonial use? Is he a prophet? If so, why didn't he say anything or prophesy? What is Jesus doing? Mark doesn't tell us and leaves us like the disciples left in the dark, unaware of what will be coming over the next week. Mark tells us that even as Jesus walked to the earth, people did not understand him. They were drawn to him, saw hope, love, peace and joy in him, but they struggled to reconcile the man who ate with sinners, healed on the Sabbath, and challenged the authority of the temple with their understanding of the world. Even as he stands and observes the temple, knowing what awaits him in the coming Holy Week, they still do not understand. The question then is, do we? As Jesus stood in the temple, taking it all in, what do you think he was thinking? I imagine he felt tired as he thought about the grand entrance he had just made. I imagine he felt anger and frustration seeing the signs of the moneylenders whose tables he would go on to flip the very next day. Perhaps he felt exasperation and weariness knowing he would be going up to spar with the religious leaders who would again try to prove he was nothing more than a heretic. Perhaps pain at knowing this would be a week where his closest friends would denounce him, deny him, and betray him. 
or fear, knowing where the week would end. With a trial he could not avoid, and one of the worst punishments imaginable. And as he walked back to Bethany that day, I imagine his friends continuing on, not knowing any of what was to come. Perhaps they even passed by the fig tree that the next morning Jesus would curse. And I wonder if knowing that his disciples were oblivious to all of this, Jesus maybe felt that on that day, he was like that fig tree, barren, alone, and dead to the world, just waiting, hoping to bloom into new life. Today is a day of joyful celebration for us. As we cry out, Alleluia, you are good, Jesus our King. It is a day of hope as we remember the promise of new life foretold to the Virgin Mary during Advent, that Jesus would be the salvation of humanity. A day of love as we remember our Savior's triumphant return to Jerusalem, ready to share God's love with all of us. And a day of peace as we rest knowing that this is a holy week, a week where we will journey with Jesus to the cross and out of the grave, and a day of joy as we lift up a lo loud hosanna, evil has been overcome. Yet for Jesus, that day was anything but these things. It was a day of knowing that even now, 2,000 years later, we would still be stuck in the temple and the tomb. The celebration of Easter is not just a day that we were saved from sin and evil. It is a celebration and a reminder that Jesus has struck down the structures that bound us, that God released us from the expectation that worship is confined to a building, sacred place, or a chosen people. It is a reminder that Jesus spent his three years in ministry speaking truth to power, avoiding praise, and dedicating his life to a world where every person's humanity and sacred worth was not just acknowledged, but cherished. The religious leadership scoffed as Jesus ate with tax collectors, people who lived morally corrupt lives and gained riches and social power by abusing the oppressed their own people. They were outraged when Jesus walked among the sick and healed them, making it possible for the outcasts to return to polite society. Jesus' ministry was about reminding the Jewish people that everyone had a place at the table, even the people they had cast out. And on this day, Jesus looked out over the temple I imagine he knew it would get him killed. The crowd that today had lifted him up would turn on him in the coming days. His message was not the one they wanted or expected. And instead of considering it, they killed him for loving the lost and the least, acknowledging the broken structures of this world, and calling the church to leave behind its walls. As I sat with this scripture this week, I found myself drawn to Jesus in the temple. Not on the branches or the celebrations, but on the man looking out, knowing what came next. It feels as if in this moment everything else stood still. The people and the noises faded away, and Jesus stood alone. I found myself walking through his journey again seeing what had already come and what was to come, as if time was no longer in control of the world. And I found myself humming a soft melody as I stood, waiting with Jesus.
I may not have actually stood with Jesus that day. And I will never know exactly what he was thinking or feeling. But this year, as I look towards Easter, I feel as if I can stand with him. I feel hope in the kingdom. The one that we see signs of in this world and yet know is yet to come fully to earth. The kingdom where LGBTQ and straight, woman, man, and non-binary, rich, poor, and middle class, black, white, Asian, Pacific Islander, and all people are able to live together as one. I feel love as I look to all of God's people. Love that inspires me to cherish and lift up every one of God's children, whether they look and live like me or not. Peace in knowing that Jesus did not go through his holy week for naught. In knowing that his life and ministry, the message he shared that got him killed, continues to strive for life in each of us and joy in knowing that Jesus did not call us to do church in the way it always has been, but instead freed us to be the church in the world. Today I invite you to join me in remembering the mysterious, charismatic, and glorious man that Jesus was and is. To dwell on the Advent promise that his life, death, and resurrection fulfilled and to surrender all that keeps us from embodying God's kingdom of grace, compassion, justice, and love as we join Christ in walking to the cross. It will not be easy. And at times we will want to run, deny, or miss the point just as the disciples did. But today we are invited to stand with God as he looks out over the temple, knowing what tomorrow will bring. Amen and amen. May you stand with Christ today. May you walk with him tomorrow. May your actions and thoughts embody God's kingdom. And may you spend this final week before Easter drawn to God's will in your life. Go with grace. Go with peace. Amen.